The following is a non-profit fan-based parody. Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z, and Dragon Ball GT are all owned by Funimation, Toei Animation, and Akira Toriyama. But they really should have let Team 4 Star monetize Dragon Ball Z Abridged. If they had, maybe we could have gotten to see Majin Buu Abridged. Please support the official release, as well as Dragon Ball Z Abridged. <laughs> you want to know what items are good? Just go Guardian Angel into my eyes. It has a massive win rate. That for sure can't go wrong. <laughs> yeah, anyway, listen. I've got one more technique that should do it. Upside is I can use stats from Lolalytics. And what's the downside? You'll have to wait while I charge it. That's not too bad. For 25 minutes. And considering champ select hands in under four. Ah, oh, never mind. I'm sure you can handle it. Wow. You really have that much faith in me? Yeah, sure. Why not? Well then, I won't disappoint you. Here goes nothing! <laughs> Ready or not, here I go! I'm charging my attack. Perhaps on second thought, a whole 25 minute startup time for a script is pretty abysmal in terms of usability and game. Aha! Going full AP Nilla. A cunning strategy. No, 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 not cunning. What's the opposite of that? Retarded! That's it, thank you! I don't have any choice! I have to use my last technique! Now die! Forfeit at 20. Ready! Analysis results. Got it! Is that what you're gonna yell out when you- Oh god! Nilla, we can't FF. Here, I'll let you farm this wave. I don't think that's gonna work. Why not? The FF is sorta already at for yeses. Wait, then how has the game not ended yet? <sighs> Goku? Goku? Hey there. Today, I'm gonna be teaching you guys a secret technique for analyzing champion stats. Look at these stats. How strong would you say Magi Soul Stealer is here? You're probably thinking, huh, I already know what he's talking about. Magi's is only built when ahead, so its win rate is inflated. Which, yeah, it is. But it has an inflated win rate, doesn't really tell me much about how strong it is. It could be that Magi's is super strong, even when behind. Or maybe it's really weak, but we don't know, because of the inflated win rate. The secret technique is something I came up with to deal with situations like this, where win rates are super biased. However, running it is slow as fuck. The results aren't always easy to work with, and it just fails half the time, so it's actually more like the Spirit Bomb than the Special Beam Cannon. It all started a long long time ago, at the end of Season 8. And yes, I understand Season 8 wasn't that long ago for those of you watching in 2023. But for the folks watching in December 2031, after the YouTube algorithm randomly decided to start recommending this video indiscriminately, it was more than 10 years ago. Anyway, back to the story. The year is 2018, and Akali has recently been reworked. The pros spammed her, so now her win rate is dog water. But baby JNC noticed something weird. Her win rate in Korea is not that bad. And despite being a baby, Lil Bro's IQ is above room temperature, so he knows it's not because Koreans are just better. He puts on his detective hat and looks deeper into it. He finds that the win rate is particularly high in silver, and specifically in the top lane. He scrolls down and finds a likely reason. Korean silver top lane Akali players don't build some pussy AP assassin build, they instead copy Fiora's Giga Chad AD Bruiser builds, and they fu- I mean win, they win. He checks the numbers on Akali's abilities, and AD Bruiser builds actually make sense. So he starts spreading propaganda about it on the Akali main subreddit, but the propaganda never catches on, so it remains a very niche build, and he stops spamming r slash Akali mains. After a while, Riot nerfs Akali again, and that sparks him to do some damage calculations, which confirm the nerf hit AP harder than AD. So Lil Bro starts the propaganda campaign again. One day, while plotting his nefarious reddit posts, Baby JNC comes up with a new approach to analyzing win rates. Noticing that the play rate of AD Bruiser Akali varied wildly over time, he decides to plot top lane Akali's overall win rate versus Trinity's peak rate for several patches in a row. This allowed him to sidestep the question about whether players tended to build Trinity more when ahead. How often the Akali players got a very early lead should be uncorrelated with the play rate of Trinity. So if the correlation was positive, then that implied that Trinity was good, even if only built well ahead and the correlation was definitely positive. 
Hopefully, you see how this might help us figure out the example at the start. But there's a problem. When we're looking at how the overall win rate varies, there are a ton of factors that affect the win rate besides Trinity's play rate, so you should take them into account as well. For example, it could be that Conqueror was what was actually increasing the win rate, but its play rate was strongly correlated with Trinity's play rate, so Trinity's play rate ended up being correlated to the overall win rate. But Baby J and C didn't think that far ahead. The fact that Trinity gaining popularity increased Akali's win rate even after a massive nerf was interesting enough for him. As time goes on, Baby J and C grows, learns more things and starts thinking about formalizing what he did with AD Bruiser Akali. He figures it should be possible to predict the champion win rates just from the play rate of items on them, so he starts playing around with linear regressions. For those of you who don't know, to do a linear regression, you assume the output variable can be computed with a sum like this, and you try to find the values for these constants that best predict the win rate. The big advantage of linear regressions over just comparing correlations is you can include many different variables in your inputs. So in the example I gave before, you could include the play rate of Conqueror in the regression, and as long as it isn't 100% correlated with the play rate of Trinity, then the regression should be able to separate the impact of both. But it turns out that just a handful of items isn't enough to predict win rates all that well. Skill max orders, summer spells, runes, matchups, etc. all also affect the overall win rate, so you need to include them in the regression as well. However, when you start including all that other stuff, a linear regression just doesn't work, because it overfits massively. See, when you're using any kind of regression or learning model, you always want way more data points than the number of parameters you're estimating. And with all the extra stuff, there are hundreds of parameters to estimate, and only one data point per patch. To deal with this, Adolescent JNC embraces his inner Agario player and splits the data he has as much as possible. By splitting all the regions apart, he can get 12 points per patch, and by filtering by keystone, he can multiply that by another 2 to 4, depending on how many keystones have enough games for stats. In practice though, smaller regions have way fewer games, so you can't actually get any decent stats from Fleet Footwork Samira in OCE, even if you can in Korea. But even with 36 data points per patch, it would still take dozens to hundreds of patches to avoid overfeeding, so he scraps the idea. More time goes by, and JNC keeps learning more and more. At some point, he stumbles upon the last piece of the puzzle. Principal Component Analysis, or PCA for short. According to Wikipedia, PCA is a popular technique for analyzing large datasets containing a high number of dimensions or features per observation, increasing the interpretability of data while preserving the maximum amount of information and enabling the visualization of multidimensional data. Uh, yeah, totally, sure, yep. According to ChatGPT, it's some shit about magic glasses or something, I don't know, I'm not high enough for this, but it concludes with, so in short, PCA helps us to see patterns and similarities in a large group of things by organizing them in a way that makes it easier for us to understand them. Which I guess is simpler to understand, but still doesn't really explain what it is, so I guess I can't just export my work to robot slaves yet. Whatever. Imagine you have these points on this graph. PCA basically first finds the axis that best fits the points, like this, and then finds the axis that best fits the points while still being perpendicular to the previous axis. This is useful because now, if I want to tell you where this point is, I can give you the coordinates along both these axes like a pleb, or I can partake in the Ligma Balls grindmill set and not waste my time giving you the second coordinate. If you just assume the second coordinate is zero, you'll get pretty close to the ground truth, because most of the variance is explained by the first axis anyway. Also, the new axes are called principal components, so I'll just call them PCs from now on. With some math fuckery, you can do this for more than two dimensions. There's also some theory about Gaussian distributions or whatever, but I've already shown enough math on screen to cause emotional damage to half the audience, so we're not gonna go into that. Anyway, with PCA, we can reduce the number of dimensions in our inputs by only using a handful of PCs in the regression, so we can avoid overfitting without needing thousands of data points, or at least in theory we can. In practice, the data points are often so closely packed that no amount of overengineering can recover the data we need. In the industry, this is referred to as garbage in, garbage out. Regardless, we can map back the data from the PCs to the original axis, which in our case are all the different play rates. 
This means that the parameters calculated with the linear regression can be mapped back as well. So here's the secret technique in full. We get as many data points as we can from Lollalytics, which takes forever because Lollalytics wasn't built to be spammed like this, and we apply the nonlinear function to the win rates. Then we use PCA to reduce the dimensions to a reasonable number so that we can do the linear regression, and then we map the results of the regression back to a usable format. Before we use it, however, we need to be aware of how it can fail. It mostly has three weak points. First, it's possible that important stuff ends up not being included in the analysis. For example, if the champion gets buffed, the regression will overvalue anything that increases in play rate after the buff. Second, if not enough PCs are used, biases between the play rates could still end up affecting the results. Third, the regression can just overfit. We can mitigate this by reducing the number of PCs used, but then we risk running into the second weak point. So, using this technique usually ends up being a delicate balancing act of including as many patches as possible to be able to use as many PCs without overfitting, while not including so many patches that changes in the game itself start affecting the results. And more often than not, it's impossible to strike a good enough balance. Due to how long it takes, and how often it fails, I usually only use this technique as a last resort. In DBZ, it really only worked in the movies and against Wu anyway. But for the sake of the video, let's just look at some examples that didn't fail, starting with Akali. These stats are from the start of Season 12, back when AP Bruiser Demonic Cam Tank Akali was a thing. Surprisingly, the most impactful playrate fluctuations weren't between the AP Bruiser build versus AP Assassin, but rather between the second items on the AP Assassin build, the summoner spell choices and the starting items. It seems Leech Pain, Durant Shield and TP were goaded, while Shadow Flame, Durant's Ring and Flash were trash. This is interesting, because if you just check the win rates of the items, it would look like AP Bruiser build was way better, but then you'd be missing that people who went with the AP Bruiser build also took Teleport and started with Run Shield way more often, rather than Flash and D-Ring. Also, all the stats pointed towards second item Lich Bane being insane on her at the time. Actually, Akali hasn't been changed much since then, so let's just rerun this analysis with more recent stats. And we see mostly the same thing, just TP vs Flash seems to have gotten less important. This is a really good indicator that the results are accurate, even with several patches in between them, the results stay generally the same. So, if you play Akali, you should probably be taking Teleport, starting Duran's Shield, and going second item Lich Vane. Unless you're part of the wave of new viewers watching in December 2031, in which case this might not be accurate anymore. Also, does League of Legends even still exist? Leave a comment down below to let me know if it does. For another example, here's Evelyn. These results are a little less trustworthy since the regression didn't fit as well as before, but it does point toward Lich Pain Rush being really good, which is consistent with its win rate. Also, Magi's looks like it really should probably be built more often. In general, it seems that Eve should be looking to go Lich Pain into Rocket Belt, but looking respectfully at Magi's the whole time. Eve is a good showcase of this technique, because Rabadons and Magi's mess so much with the win rates of all her builds that they become really hard to analyze. And for our last example, let's look at Nyla. Like Evelyn, she hasn't been changed in Season 13 yet, so we're using all the patches in it for the analysis. It seems the most impactful play rate fluctuations are between Conqueror and Lethal Temple, with Conqueror just being far better. Besides that, surprisingly, Rushing Immortal Shieldbow looks better than Ravenous Hydra, which I'm guessing is because Hydra first usually means Mythic second, rather than Collector, and Collector is really good on her. In theory, the regression should be able to deal with this correlation, but I think it's small enough to not get explained by the PCs. Regardless, we get more confirmation that Collector is insane on Isla, and that you really shouldn't be going Phantom Dancer. Also, Duran Shield is a bad starting item on her. She also had a stretch of time between patch 12.14 and the pre-season where she didn't get directly changed, so we can look at that to validate the results a bit. And again, yeah, the results were mostly consistent. Lethal Tempo is bad, Phantom Dancer is bad, The Shield is bad, Conquer is good, and Collector is good. Makes sense that this didn't change much, because none of these really got changed in the meanwhile. Unfortunately, I can't realistically make the script I use in this public, because the only thing differentiating it from a DDoS attack on Hololytics is one time.sleep, and I can trust you guys to not remove it, especially because it's what makes the script so slow. But yeah, that's all I have to show you today. 
At the end of my videos, I usually ask you guys to include a random word in the comments so I know you watch till the end, but it gets very obvious what the word is when every comment is talking about otolaryngologists, plus it makes the comment section way more boring. So this time I'm trying something different. I want you to leave a joke in the comments, and in the next video I'll include the funniest joke at the end. I look forward to reading all your funny comments. Well, that's everything. See you next time.